Welcome to News Click. Uh, for the past few months, we have seen attacks on the Dalits increasing, and there's also a change in discourse with the politics of the country moving towards the right. And to discuss with us is Professor Amit Thorat, who is a faculty at JNU. He is an economist by training who specializes on the issues of discrimination, untouchability, and other uh, urban issues. So, welcome to News Click, Dr. Amit. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You had conducted a study recently, which was published in the med uh, mainstream media, about uh, the practices of untouchability prevalent in the society. Though the practice of untouchability is banned by the Indian constitution, but like you mentioned in your paper, that practice is still there in the minds of the people and nothing has been done about it. So could you throw some background on your study and how, what uh, findings you had about in the study? So the survey is an all India survey. Uh, it covers about 47,554 uh, households, it's pan India, it's representative at national level uh, and uh, it's a big survey with a lot of information. Uh, we asked two questions to all our sample households. Uh, the first question was, does any member in your family practice untouchability? Uh, yes or no? And if they said yes, then fine. If they say no, then we ask an additional question. Uh, would it be okay if someone from a, a low, lower caste uh, was to enter your kitchen or use your utensils? Would that be fine with you? Yes or no? So uh, combining the responses to both of these questions, we found that about 30% of rural households and 20% of urban households in India uh, accepted openly uh, by saying that either uh, someone in their household practices are untouchable. You mentioned previously that it was basically a poverty study that you were also looking and how do you, you were mentioning about how you studied the class angle and then for making it clear in the Indian context you made it a you studied the caste groups of the class. Can you throw some light on that? So this is a survey which happened twice, uh, once in 2004-05 and then in, again in 11-12. The uniqueness of this data set, it's called the India Human Development Survey, is that the households which we surveyed in the first round, we again revisit the same household. So you can effectively track the households over a period of seven years. Um, so we can find out uh, whether households over a period of seven years became poor, that is they fell into poverty or rose out of poverty. So uh, we found that uh, uh, over the period of seven years, uh, poverty has fallen drastically in India. Uh, it has never fallen by that much magnitude ever. Uh, so s nearly 71% of urban poor and 64% of rural poor these are households who were poor in the first round, 2004-05, had escaped poverty by 11-12. Uh, so when you look at national sample survey data, we only see that poverty is falling. What this data allows you to do is, it also tells you, not, it just, just doesn't tell you who is escaping poverty, but it can also tell you who has fallen into poverty. So could you throw some light on the social categories of who escaped poverty yes. and who had fallen into poverty? So we find that uh, while people are escaping poverty, they are also falling into poverty. However, uh, the shares of households who are falling into poverty is disproportionately higher among the tribals, which is 24%, among the scheduled castes, 19%, OBC, 14%, and Muslim, 16%. So these are households who became poor over this period of time, whereas only 10% of forward caste households became poor. The poor, unlike the West, they are not a single unitary uh, category. Here Dr. Ambedkar said, the, it is, uh, the caste is nothing but the division of labourers. So do you want to share some things of how these labourers are divided when it comes to discrimination, untouchability, or uh, these practices that are there? Yeah, so what you mentioned in your study that though they might be poor, but also the belief in caste and their values is so high that they intend to practice untouchable to so. Yeah, so, uh, so as I was saying earlier, we found that about 27% of the households in, in India uh, accepted to practicing untouchability. Then we were curious who are these people. So when we broke them down and saw their social belongings, we found that the 
largest share or or within each community say among the brahmins say of um, all of our all our sample of brahmins nearly half of them 52 percent said yes they practice untouchability uh, but surprisingly we found that ob obese amongst the obc 33 percent and amongst the st 22 percent also said they want practice untouchability now this was a little surprising because uh, and we were wondering why this is so and we can only hypothesize and we think that this is because uh, as as the economy is growing there is more competition for uh, uh, jobs and and with these jat agitations etc we find that the ability of a lot of obc and maybe maybe tribals to uh, uh, catch on to the bandwagon of say economic growth with in terms of the kind uh, the, the kinds of job that are avail available anyway it's a jobless growth we all know that uh, so the competition for these small number of private sector job has intensified and that has led to conflict between the obcs and the scs for the most forward casts as well right it's just and them yeah. them also because yes uh, so, so we do find that uh, uh, it's just not the Brahmins or the forward caste who are practicing untouchability, but this is also seen to be happening amongst the OBCs and the tribals. So, then, uh, what, what, do you think uh, this is because of the notion of purity pollution that is ingrained in our shastras? Yeah. Because your paper talks about the theoretical aspects. Do you want to? I think say yes. Um, I mean. So, so, so there are other studies which also show that the idea, where does this come from? Why do people practice untouchability or uh, discriminate against certain kinds of people? Uh, that is because of their belief, uh, and it's not based. It's not based in any scientific factuality. Uh, uh, so, it's a it's a belief which comes from myth and mythology, and there is a notion that. Uh, uh, interacting with, associating with, touching with uh, people will pollute you spiritually and physically. And it, it comes from uh, the, uh, this belief in the notion of purity and pollution. For instance, I will give an example. Another study which uh, I, I did with um, Dean Spears, who is from Princeton and now at uh, University of Texas, we found that, uh, so, so, so just to give a background, 60% um, of all people who defecate in the world live in India and all 70% of all rural uh, households defecate in India. But uh, whereas in Bangladesh which is poorer than us, Kenya which is poorer than us, only 10 or 15 odd percent people defecate. We are more educated, more richer than them and we are still defecating in the open. Why is that? Talking on that sense of uh, open defecation and the beliefs, it's strongly that they are, it is a cultural value. But then people also thought with the modernity coming and the new constitution being in place, our freedom fighters thought that India would move towards a direction of progress and change. But in your paper, you had said that the social change is very, very slow. And you talked about the purity and pollution are hard to be wiped out from the people's mind in spite of their education. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's strange how, so, so I think we, in many ways, um, these ideas of who we are, what should be our belief system, what should be our values are something which pick up, we pick up in our homes and in our communities, which are passed on from father to son, mother to daughter, grandfather, grandmother to, you know, grandchildren. And this is a, this is intrinsically embroiled with your identity. Uh, and how do you break the, those belief systems? How do you capture the young uh, to have a different idea uh, about, uh, you know, e equality, about humanity, about fraternity? And the only way I see it is intervention, which is through public education or even private education. So in schools, if, if we talk about untouchability, we talk about, uh, you know, caste and we teach children that, this is a bad habit, this is illegal and this is also not socially desirable. At a young age, it may have an impression. I am not saying it will uh, go all the way to eradicate it uh, because you have social pressures of conformity. Uh, children want to please their parents, they want to identify their, with, with the kinship group and identification means following their rituals, practices, etc. Right. So, 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 it's very difficult, it's, it's almost like um, divorcing or tearing yourself away from your community and forming your own identity, which could be a secular identity, a non-religious identity and it's not easy. Unless there is a overall social milieu 
uh, in, in your school, in your colleges, where, where your uh, people who are your gurus and teachers tell you this is right to do and is okay to do that. I just wanted to know, is there a regional variation to this in your study? Did you find across the states where it is more prevalent or we say for example where in some states the social movement might have been taking place for a long time. So you see there is a change in the perception or what do you think? Does your data show a regional variation on the practice of untouchability? Yeah, actually you're right, it does. Um, so we find uh, when we look at our state samples of the incidence of the practice of untouchability, we find that the practice is, um, to my mind, not surprisingly, uh, more prevalent in the north of India. So Madhya Pradesh and above, it is very high. In fact, Himachal is highest, and it's very, it's lower. I wouldn't say it's it's very low, but it's um, roughly, say, about. 20 to 20 percent and lower in as you go below Maharashtra and when you look at Maharashtra and Kerala in particular it's very low and we were, we were puzzled why is that happening and there could be two reasons one is that both these places in Maharashtra you had had the Ambedkar movement Ambedkar was from Maharashtra and he was he, he, he was the reason for the emancipation of the Dalits and he, he had his own the, the entire ideology uh, so, so, so it is possible that in Maharashtra the practice is low or even if it exists, our respondents were uh, politically aware uh, to give an answer which is to say, that, no, 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 we don't practice it. And Kerala also shows the same. But Kerala, there uh, has been a history of uh, the Dalits uh, leading a movement and supported by the progressive uh, uh, population. Uh, so, do you think that might, because it's also one of the highly educated uh, societies. Left tradition in Kerala, which is also very liberal. So I think at a political, personal political level, uh, the understanding that uh, to, sh uh, uh, to shun uh, untouchability and caste identities is there. Now does that mean that there is no practice of untouchability? I, I would not go as far as yeah. to say that because uh, we know of instances where it happens. Dr. Amit, what do you think is the way out for the society? Is there a message of how people should get rid of this? untouchability or say the caste discrimination or it's a long fight? So it's, a, it's, it's not an easy question to answer because there are a lot of uh, the, the, the data which we have suggest certain things. Uh, but I would not say that it's all bleak because even if we go by the respondents, um, the responses we got from our interviewers, uh, interviewees I'm sorry, is that about 30 percent people say that they practice untouchability. If we agree to that uh, and even if it is an underestimate, uh, there is there's a majority who claims they do not practice. So at the face value it is a good thing. But at the same time we hear these incidences of caste violence, atrocities, etc. So are they, are they uh, just outliers or fringe elements uh, who are doing all this? Well, no, I mean, I think it goes deep into our uh, belief in who we are. And if, if you have uh, people, communities, ideologies, which fan these ideas, either politically uh, that people are different, it could be a Hindu-Muslim identity, it could be within Hindus, a caste identity, uh, and, and want to make profit on it, either politically or economically. Uh, then uh, I think uh, these ideas are uh, just under the surface to uh, in, uh, just under the surface so that anyone who scratches it you, you know your, 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 your uh, bigotry comes out yeah. and it is spilled over in, in the society. And the way out is very I mean it's, it's, a, it's very difficult because as a Hindu if we are 80 percent of us or 85 percent of us are Hindu, by default we have a caste identity. Now to say that I would not practice any kind of caste marriage or uh, a kind of uh, social interaction which is mediated through caste is impossible unless I shun my Hindu identity. So it is uh, and, and, and to ask people to do that. Um, because the constitution um, bans untouchability or makes it an atrocity, uh, it is difficult for people to do that unless they, unless we create a society from scratch 
where uh, the generations who are indoctrinated or who have picked it up are uh, we cannot do anything about them, but the younger generations to come can be exposed to these ideas, egalitarian ideas of equality, liberty and fraternity where caste is not the lens through which you see humanity or your fellow beings. Uh, but it is not going to be easy, uh, it, it needs to be taken up as a social value okay. by all uh, and, and, and it has to be systematically talked about uh, uh, in schools, in colleges, uh, wherever you have these issues of discrimination, exclusion, honor killing etc. Uh, and not just the people who are suffering have to talk about it, in fact the people who are perpetrators or people who come from the communities where from which this idea of purity pollution uh, comes uh, need to be part of the debate and discourse. Thank you Dr. Amit uh, for taking your time and talking to News Click. Thank you. Thank you for having me.